Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, looks like we have about 200 people so far. I'm gonna do what I always do and make sure I shut off my music all the way so it doesn't interrupt us. Uh, my name is Brooke Edmonds. I'm with OSU Extension and I um, moderate and run this advanced training webinar for Master Gardeners and for the general public that's interested in what's happening at OSU. So today we have two speakers that are going to be taking turns sharing. So we have Alex Stone, who is an associate professor and extension vegetable crop specialist at OSU. She works with a lot of different projects. So some that were focused on were um, uh, conventional and organic vegetable farmers working on different plant diseases and cover crop projects. She partners or has partnered with the Oregon Processed Vegetable Commissions on its sustainability initiatives and then is also a leadership team member of eOrganic, which is an online organic agriculture resource area. And then Lane Selman is now an assistant professor of practice at Oregon State University and has worked on a ton of different projects on organic vegetable farmers across the Pacific Northwest on many different collaborative research projects. And in 2012, Lane created the Culinary Breeding Network to increase communication and collaboration between plant breeders, seed growers, fresh market vegetable farmers, produce buyers and chefs to improve the quality of vegetables um, with a focus on public and independent open source organic breeding work. So many of you may know her from that project. So at this point, I am gonna just, we'll do the little technical uh, juggling and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then we'll let Alex take it away. And again, there'll be time at the end and we'll do some moderated Q&A. So questions for the presenters, please put them into the Q&A box. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting us. This is fun. We like to talk about squash. So I want to give you a little background on our or my project, which is the, sort of the production aspect of winter squash. Um, I actually got interested in working and started working on winter squash because of some disease problems that I'll talk to you a little bit about. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but this, the Willamette Valley is the center for confectionery squash seed production, which are those big white pumpkin seeds that you would eat at a baseball game that are really salty. And right around the Corvallis area is sort of the North American center for production of those pumpkins. They call them pumpkins. They're really kind of like a orange Hubbard squash and you'll see them growing around the valley. Um, so there are some diseases associated with that crop that got me started working in winter squash. And then I also was talking to fresh market growers who said that they would basically grow winter squash, take it out of the field, it would immediately rot, and they would throw it away. And so that clearly is not a very profitable thing to do. So those were the things that were happening in sort of my vegetable production world that got me working into it with winter squash. And then well, I was working with Lane and other people also with um, farmers who sold locally and the winter vegetable marketplace was growing really fast. There were a lot of winter farmers markets and chefs looking for local foods during the winter. And because, you know, winter squash is called winter squash, you'd think, well, you could certainly be able to eat that and buy it and grow it and sell it in the winter. But because of this storage rot problem that they were having, the farmers were having, they didn't have squash to sell in the winter. So that's, those were the things that we were working on. So how do I make this go to the next slide? Oh, there we go. All right. So um, the goals of our project, and I'm sorry there's so many words here, were to identify squash resistant to a soil-borne disease. Uh-oh, I think I have the wrong. Oh no, okay. Uh, I'll just go to the next slide. Okay, so the first, one of the first goals was to identify squash resistant to the soil-borne disease that was causing yields of that, those orange squash that 
were grown for confectionery seed here. Those yields had been going down for like 20 years. And we also were seeing that with winter squash yields in general. And I, a lot of the farmer, the fresh market growers I worked with were really interested in growing kabocha squash and their yields were so low that it was just not very profitable. And we did show that kabochas are particularly susceptible to this disease. And that was what was causing these low yields. So if, I don't know how prevalent this might be in gardens because you typically get this disease because you just grow too much squash over and over again. <laughs> so if that's a problem in your garden, maybe you do have this disease, but you can dig up your roots and you'll see that squash roots normally are white. And these, as you see in this photo, are brown and they actually even will fall apart. And when it's really bad, you can actually just pull the plants right out of the ground close to harvest, which is clearly not a good sign. But often farmers wouldn't know that they have it because this happens really gradually over the years. And the plants are, normally they don't die, but occasionally in really bad situations they'll actually die and you'll see wilting in the field. But typically they just, the plants over the years just get smaller and smaller the fruit becomes smaller and smaller and your yields go down. So that was one of the diseases we were working on. And then the other one was this, this disease that fresh market growers were telling me that I honestly didn't really believe, which they said, well, you know, we grow the squash at great expense <laughs> and then we put it in a barn and then it immediately rots and we don't even get to Thanksgiving, much less actual winter. And so we did work on this, and I worked on these diseases with Ken Johnson's lab, who's he's a plant pathologist at OSU, and Hannah Rividal, his graduate student, did a lot of work on these diseases. And I don't know how many of you are familiar, have seen this on your squash, but this is quite prevalent, at least in the Willamette Valley. Um, and it, this is the blossom end of the squash fruit here, and you'll see this white and pinkish fluffy fungal growth that starts at the blossom end. These fungi actually, or a particular fungus actually colonizes the flower at bloom and then lives not causing symptoms in the squash. And then as the squash ripens, it will start here, but then pretty rapidly consume the whole fruit. And I, you know, and we don't have either of these diseases in other parts of the United States, or certainly not to the extent that we do here. And this pathogen, Fusarium culmorum, is a grass seed pathogen. So we think that because we grow so much grass seed here, this is why we have so much of this and potentially why it's so particularly virulent on winter squash here. So it was no joke we grew all these squash at the research station. We brought them into the barn and the most susceptible varieties immediately rotted. It was astonishing, really. I had never seen anything like it. So this is very different than the experiences growing winter squash in other parts of the country and even potentially in other parts of Oregon. So it's important to know. And I don't know how prevalent these would be in gardens because I've never really looked at that. And so then the third goal was to, to actually identify squash that were both inherently long storing, like some squash, you know, people say, oh, delicatas, they don't really store very long, you eat them immediately after harvest. Some squash are inherently more long storing than others, and some of them you can't even eat right after harvest, they need to ripen before you eat them. So what we were trying to find were long squash that were both long storing and also resistant to this storage disease as well as that soil borne disease because we didn't also want them to have low yields because they were really susceptible to that soil borne disease. So we did a lot of trialing of varieties and I'm not gonna talk about all of them here. I'm gonna show you some of the, the highest performing ones. So we actually trialed a lot at the beginning. For example, we trialed all of, our farmers were very interested in kabocha squash. And so we trialed a lot of kabocha squash and immediately rejected them because they were susceptible both to that soil borne disease and to the storage rot. And so we just stopped working with them. 
So what you'll see in the data that I'm showing you are the ones that, even if they're not very high performing in the data that I show you, they're way higher performing than the ones that we're not talking about. <laughs> Because kabochas are susceptible to both of these problems, really susceptible. And I love kabocha squash, so I was really into this. Um, so anyway, here are some examples of um, some of the squash that we grew. We grew a lot more kabochas than you see here. Our emphasis initially was on kabochas, um, but then ultimately we did throw in some other types like some butternuts uh, and some an acorn uh, spaghetti squash some delicatas also the other goal that i didn't actually address at the beginning was that um, we have also been interested in looking to see if you can grow squash without supplemental irrigation or what's called dry farming so many farmers in the valley don't either don't have water rights or they don't have water rights for all their land or some don't have water rights or they're losing them because of climate change so i have been working with amy garrett and the dry farming collaborative and actually amy worked for a little while on the squash project which is how i became interested in dry land squash production and so one of the other things that we were doing in this project was to compare varieties when they were grown with and without irrigation and to look at the impact on yield and also to look at the impact on storage duration. So we, one of the squash that we worked on that I talk about a lot because it was definitely the highest, just like the poster child for deep winter squash sales and also because it's resistant to everything is called tetsu kabuto and this squash is from japan as you might imagine from its name i had only ever heard of it as a rootstock so you can graft melons so you 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 say oh i would really like to grow this delicious melon but my soil has fusarium wilt in it or something a terrible disease of melon. So I can't grow this delicious melon, which is what my consumers want. So Tetsu Kabuto is one is a rootstock that you grow Tetsu Kabuto and you grow this delicious melon and then you cut them both in half and you stick the melon top on the Tetsu bottom root the root and you then can grow that delicious melon on your soil that has a disease in it successfully. So I started growing because I didn't even know that Tetsu Kabuto was a winter squash. I thought it was some kind of weird, wild cucurbit or something. Um, because I knew that it was resistant to soil-borne diseases and I wanted to see if it was resistant to the soil-borne diseases we had here. However, then I discovered by talking to a Japanese technician that works in the vegetable program, he said, you know, that is a winter squash that's eaten in Japan, which I had no idea. So I, we actually included it as one of our squashes. And what ended up happening, to make a long story short, is that it's resistant to the soil-borne disease. It's totally resistant to the, the storage rot. And it's really delicious. And it's very inherently long storing. And it's really high yielding. It's sort of a wonder squash. So Lane is sitting there falling asleep because I talk about Tetsu so much. but we really love Tetsu Kabuto. And we call it Tetsu for short. That's our nickname for it. So uh, I'm going to send you this data in a handout after the presentation. But basically, we did a lot of very hard work. And when I say we, Jenny Wetzel was my graduate student at the time. And she and a bunch of us, including me, did a lot of work both growing the squash, putting it into storage, rotating it in storage and throwing out a lot of rotten squash. So it's really a lot of work. And we did this um, with both uh, with irrigation and growing them dry land. So I just want to point out some highlights from this, but you'll be able to get these figures and look at them yourself. So Tetsu Kabuto is here. And Tetsu was, uh, this is, 
I believe, coming out of the field. Um, so this is, yeah, at harvest. Okay, so this is Tetsu Kabuto, and this is tons per hectare. So this is really a high yielding squash. It actually was out yielded by this very small hybrid uh, spaghetti squash, which is amazing, very productive squash. And then North Georgia Candy Roaster, which is a very strange squash, but it's so high yielding that it's astonishing. Um, these are, this is a pink banana squash. But of, so this spaghetti squash was very high yielding, but it has a limited market and we were really very interested in things that were more like kabocha types and tetsu is an interspecies hybrid, but it is more like a kabocha than many other squash. Um, and so these dark gray bars are the yield at harvest when grown with irrigation and then the light gray bars are dry land. So small wonder actually did amazingly well dry land. And in some fields, it actually yielded more dry land than it did with irrigation. It's quite an astonishing variety. But Tetsu Kabuto has small commercial type fruit. They're appealing to consumers just visually and they also taste really good in store for a long time. I will mention, however, Sweet Mama is a really great traditional kabocha squash. It was an All-America selection back in the 70s. I had never really grown Sweet Mama before. It's an excellent, excellent kabocha that is somewhat resistant to the sowborn disease, and, and it's the most resistant to the storage rot of any of the other true kabochas. So I highly recommend Sweet Mama. Sweet Mama is a very big fruit. And one of the things that we looked at was planting density. So if you grow sweet mama and you grow a lot of plants in a small space, you can actually reduce the fruit size so that it's not quite as big because it's bigger than what most people want in a kabocha. So we did look at different storage methods and what we discovered was that you can store winter squash, just keep it above freezing anywhere. You don't need to have a specialized environment. And so a lot of our work subsequently was simply in a, a storage space that we kept above freezing. This is where we stored our squash. So I just want to show you very briefly um, what, what stored the best, which I've already sort of told you, which is Tetsu Kabuto, which is here. So with irrigation essentially and dry land, here we are in January in storage and then in March in storage. And what you can see is that the tetsu bars actually never fall, whereas you see a lot of dropping off here in yield in January and March as things rot in storage. Tetsu kabuto essentially doesn't rot. <laughs> and so, and it maintains its quality and is really, really delicious. And Lane is going to talk a little bit more about that. So tetsu kabuto certainly was our star. Small wonder grown dry land stored very long. Um, Sweet Mama also stored longer when grown dry land, and this is something that we've shown over and over that dry land grown squash stores longer, which particularly for squash that don't store for very long could be a real benefit. Anyway, so Tetsu Kabuto was sort of our wunderkind squash. This is Tetsu. It starts out very dark green with these yellow stripes and which are now green to yellow stripes it then matures into being orange so you can sort of watch it change in color over time and it has an amazing sensory quality and and lane will talk a little bit about some of that um, i did want to just mention that sweet mama if you're really looking for a kabocha squash is outperformed every other kabocha that we tried and we really trialed a lot of them. And that's it. So we'll, um, maybe we'll just hold all the questions till the end. Does that, does that work okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So then we'll, we're gonna just transition here and let Lane pull up her portion of the presentation.
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about like the, um, the outreach and marketing and culinary evaluations that we've done for in these projects. And there's been a, a couple of different projects that we've worked on. So here's Alex with her squash roll t-shirt, um, myself, and this is Tim Wastel that's next to Alex, who's our collaborating chef that's tasted more squash than maybe any other chef in, on earth. <laughs> um, so um, uh, you'll get to hear more about what he's done with us. Um, just a little bit about Culinary Breeding Network, which you already introduced before, but that is bringing together uh, the plant breeders, seed growers, produce um, buyers, farmers, and chefs, and all the different stakeholders together um, to be a part of these projects. So we're not just talking to farmers, but we're also talking to the folks that are doing the breeding work uh, and then know a lot about seeds so that we can uh, get more information about varieties that we potentially might want to trial. And then the folks that are actually going to be using the products at the end, whether that be chefs or someone that has a company that's value added, or like when we're talking about Hollis pumpkin seeds, the folks that, um, you know, sell those so that we understand what the market actually needs in all these different vegetables, um, as well as grains. Um, oops. Okay. And then um, and the way that Culinary Reading Network works is it, it just kind of does the outreach and the marketing uh, for a lot of different projects um, at Oregon State University. So um, I think these are just some of the projects. Novik, which is the one that Alex was talking about also that where we did squash trials as part of Novik to try to identify varieties that performed really well for organic farmers and tasted good. And we started seeing, we worked with butternut and delicata and, and heard a lot of these problems about um, storage issues. Um, and then our Eat Winter Squash is our first winter squash project that um, Alex has been talking about. And then that's led into also this other eat winter vegetables. And I'm gonna talk about both of those. Um, and it's not really important for people to know the difference, it's just they have been two different projects that were funded by different or, um, entities. So the first project, which was eat winter squash. Um, these are some of, I just wanted to put in here some of the different squash that we were looking at at that point in time. And Alex did touch on this a little bit, whereas we, these are not all like really commercially viable as far as um, people don't wanna buy them essentially. They're either, they're too large, you know, most of the time they're too large. So these are a lot of times are very large squash or just very odd squash that people are used to seeing squash being a particular thing, whether it's butternut or delicata or something that's kind of like the kabochas are nice to work with because they're smaller. Um, in our market in the United States, we can't um, cut them like these slices that you see here and sell them that way unless we wrap them. And people don't, aren't, don't really tend to gravitate toward buying them in that way. Um, they have to be processed, basically cut in a commercial kitchen and then wrapped. And, doesn't look as nice as it does and romantic as you see it in like European markets where people will buy squash more like that. Um, we found both with our restaurant customers that we were working with in these projects, they really enjoyed um, the larger squash that stored very long typically and tasted really great. And a lot of times they, um, weren't ready to eat until much later on. So it was putting the winter, this really truly was putting the winter back in winter squash where a lot of these varieties would store until not just March and April, but even May and June. Um, and so a lot of the, the restaurant chefs that we worked with did very much appreciate these, but as far as like selling them in a farmer's market or at a grocery store, not very viable. So we first worked with these and evaluated them quite a bit. We worked with Tim and another um, person named Linda Caldwell, who does more um, home cooking um, work, and she um, and they both really liked a lot of these and put together a lot of um, recipes for us uh, to distribute to people. But really, wasn't that they weren't very commercially viable. So when we went on to the next project, um, that Alex, when she selected squash, she selected uh, different squash that would be more viable, you know, um, commercially. So this is a, one of the websites that we um, um, came up with, eatwintersquash.com. Um, it's a really fan, this is just a screenshot, but I really encourage you to go to the websites I'm going to tell you about today. They're really fantastic. Um, so this is Shim over here, our chef that worked on this project, but there's multiple chefs that um, were restaurant chefs as well as home chefs and people that come up with very approachable 
uh, recipes for people to use different types of squash in. Um, we also have the squash, and I'll show you a screenshot of that, where all the squash that were in the project had really beautiful photos taken and descriptions um, and recipes to go along with those. Um, and then we have recipes where there's a lot of like very um, home friendly recipes that were developed uh, to encourage people to cook squash at home. Um, we also have videos on here. I'll talk about that later. And then types, which I'll, I'll show you about. We split them into four different types so that you could use um, recipes interchangeable with different types of squash if you knew the type of squash it was. So here's a screenshot of just, this is just one um, screenshot. I think there's 12 maybe different squash that were in this project. And so it goes into each one. Uh, you get to see nice pictures of them. You click on each one and it gets you further in-depth information. This is a bit, this is like the uh, consumer forward page. So it doesn't get into a lot of the, um, you know, how it performed in the field and how it stores and all that for the farmers. But this is for the consumers in which you could look it up, learn more about the squash, learn about its uh, best application and the way that it tastes and the best way, you know, to use it and get you excited about different types of squash. Um, and so you can see here, there's several different species here. We have a Maxima on the left, the Tetsu Kubota, which is, I never get tired of hearing about Alex. <laughs> R4 Tetsu Kubota or Tetsu as we call it, which is an interspecies um, cross of Machada and Maxima. And then this is Gills, Bull and Pippin that comes from our local seed company, Adaptive Seeds, um, and that's a Pepo. Um, yeah, and I just want to mention that Gills, Golden Pippin is an Oregon heirloom, and it's a small orange acorn that is really long storing. I didn't mention that when I was talking, but Gill's Seed Company was a seed company way back in Oregon, early Oregon history out of Portland, Oregon, and developed both sweet meat, which was in one of these photos, which is a big Oregon heirloom, long storing squash, and then also Gill's Golden Pippin that you see here. So when you get under the types, um, there's four different, we split it up into four different types and little stickers that folks, um, you know, farmers could put onto the, um, the fruits when they sell them. And one says like, I'm a simple squash, which is just for simple applications, just plain roasting typically. This is the saucy squash. So these are ones that, that hold up really well um, in like, you know, in a soup or in a curry or something where there's a lot of liquid involved. Um, and then there's like sweet squash, which are ones that are pretty appropriate uh, and do well in like desserts, pumpkin pies and cakes, that type of thing. Um, and then salad squash, which was one that was really exciting that the chefs actually brought to our attention in that they were saying, you know, you don't have to always cook uh, winter squash. And this is something that is a big um, issue it seems like in marketing these and people are like apprehensive and think that they don't want to cook squash because well for one we found out that they're afraid to cut it so we'll, we'll talk about that they're 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 very afraid to hurt themselves while cutting into large squash or any or you know um, hard rinded squash um, and then also they don't really like how long it takes to cook to cook them um, and so there's, there's a lot of different ways that are shown on this website of how to cook thing, them that don't take as long, you know, cubing them obviously and cooking them in sauces, but you can actually take them and shred them and use them in salads or in like slaws. And that is something that is just a different way to use it and more exciting, I think for some people. Um, so there's quite a few of those recipes on here and people have really liked it as long as you're using the right squash. So this is what Tim did a lot of, and I wasn't going to get into lots of in-depth information about that, but Tim went through and um, in this project, we would give him many different fruits of each different variety at, you know, every month. And he had to evaluate them for, um, you know, if they were ripe or not ready to eat because we wanted to differentiate them into like, like these are the ones that are available and taste good in January versus the ones that taste good still and um, have great texture in April. So those are very different squash from one another. So we want to differentiate them in when they are actually available and taste the best um, as far as flavor and for texture. And then also, um, what you would actually do with them. 
Um, so I think this was like a really cool thing that came out of this. So the recipes, when you go into the recipe section and you look at like, um, there's like a, this really great um, treviso, which is a type of radicchio and um, black futsu, which is one of the squash that we worked with um, that was identified as great raw um, salad together. So it says black futsu, but in parentheses it says, or any type of um, you know, um, salad squash. And so then you can just click over to the salad squash page and you can see the different squash that you're able to choose from that are gonna be the best suited for that recipe because not all of them are great in that application. So this is the eatwintersquash.com. There's some, some videos on there. I'm gonna talk a little bit about videos when we get to the next section. But um, then we moved into bringing squash also into this Eat Winter Vegetables project that both Alex and I are involved with. And so this is a two-year project. It's uh, funded by a specialty crop block program grant. Um, and so we have multiple um, vegetables that we're working with. We have eight different vegetables, one of which is winter squash. And we focused in even more when we worked on this one where we chose black futsu and tetsu kubodo because we feel like those are um, the most commercially viable um, and the ones that we can uh, market really easily and have some traction. People get really excited about the black futsu because um, it is really great um, raw. And I think that's a really great application in a way that we can promote it quite a bit. You can actually also tell when it is um, uh, ripe because that's a problem when people are buying squash and then they cut it open and they taste it and it's not actually ripe yet. And they think, oh, I just don't like this squash, but it's actually, it's just not ripe yet. So that one changes colors. Um, so you can tell when it actually is ripe um, and it's the right size as well. And then Kezu Kubodo has just been I mean, people just freak out about it. It tastes great. And it is the iron helmet. It lasts um, a really long time in storage. So in the, in this project, we have all these different vegetables we're working with. We grow lots of different varieties of each of the other ones. Um, we market them and promote them. We have outreach um, activities and I'll show you some of those um, that we've had already. One of which was the uh, fill your pantry. Um, sale and the Sagra. So our part in our project is organizing that Sagra, which is a celebration. Um, and the Fill Your Pantry is run by Friends and Family Farmers and it's done um, it typically at the beginning of December. And alongside that, that sale where farmers are selling vegetables for that store well and also just fresh, um, they have you know meat, nuts, cheese, um, grains, flour, things that you can take home and, and, and hold on to and use for the winter mark, uh, winter time when there's not as many markets. And so we had about, and, and the Sagra portion was we took those winter vegetables and had chefs and culinary educators create dishes that were easy to make at home, give away the recipes that go along with that, and people got to taste them. And it promoted them, and then it made them also say, oh, wow, celeriac, I had no idea, I really like that. Um, and they could taste something that was, and they could look at the recipe and say, yeah, I can make that at home, and they could go right over to a farm stand and buy it. And so um, squash was a part of that. Um, and so we had over a 1,000 attendees came to that. And we had 31 farmers that participated in that and sold more than $87,000 um, in, in food there. So that was pretty exciting. This is one of the stands that showed the different um, winter squash that they had available at that time. So one thing that we do there, you know, it's all about promoting people to actually eat these things. Um, and so, like I said, squash butchery, we always have uh, Tim show people how to cut winter squash safely. Um, so that they um, have less fear because that seems to be a really big problem, particularly as you see some of the squash in this, in this um, slide with Tim are quite large and people are pretty apprehensive about cutting into those. Um, and he's standing here and he's talking to a lot of people and interacting and he does give them tips on how to use it, how to store the pieces that they are, um, you know, once they cut up the whole thing, how to store it and what to do with it. Um, and then there's sample dishes and recipes. This on the left-hand side is the, that salad. I, it's on both the Eat Winter Vegetables and Eat Winter Squash website. It's a really fantastic recipe. 
um, with radicchio as well as raw winter squash. Um, it, I encourage people to try. And on the other side here is like a little snacking cake. This is one way that we try to get people excited about squash is putting it into desserts. It's a great way to get kids to eat it. You know, you if you're going to roast an entire squash, you're going to have leftovers, just stick it into like a little Tupperware and freeze it and have it for later and then stick it into pancakes or our, our cake batters or something like that. So you can go, this is um, the Eat Winter Vegetables has its own separate website as well, also with recipes. So this is, a, this is just a screenshot. There are more of them, but these are different culinary educators and chefs in our local community that participated and made dishes that were, like I said, simple to use. There's recipes available there as well as online here um, that you can, you can take a look at, print out, and, and use them as you like. Um, and then also here's our um, videos. We've got some really great videos um, that are on the website. There's some on the Eat Winter Squash website, and there's also more on the Eat Winter Vegetables. It includes other vegetables. On the top left-hand side is Catherine Doomling that many of you might know. She has a business called Cook With What You Have and tries to empower people to um, just learn more about cooking um, and cooking with have what's available to you and so she's cooking with Tetsu Kubota right here she's also a big fan of it and the bottom right hand side is um is Tim Wastel the chef who is um in his video he is showing us how to execute that actual that, that salad I was telling you about that was really fantastic and here's the photos that are really nice of those particular squash um, another event that we do that's part of this project to get people excited about winter squash is the variety showcase this incorporates our seed community and plant breeders that are working on breeding um, new varieties of things. So better winter squash that tastes better, um, grows great for uh, organic farmers and stores well, like what Alex has been talking about. So this was a very, very popular table. Alex was there to talk about the project. Michael Mazurk is in this picture. He's a plant breeder uh, at Cornell University with a little bitty squash that he's working on. Um, the honey nut and the 808 are two types of machada butternut squash that he's been breeding. Um, and so this is uh, the pastry chef at Paley's Place, which is a restaurant here in Portland, Oregon. And she made this Tetsu Kubota cream. Um, and that waffle cone is made from barley, from bar the barley um, project that I also work on. And that's some of the purple karma barley that you see at the bottom that was holding it up. The display looked really beautiful. People, I heard, I didn't taste this. Alex can tell us that it was delicious. I heard about this of all 40 tables. This is the one I heard about the most. People were so excited about it. Yeah, and all it was was Tetsu Kabuto just baked or roasted and with a tiny bit of sugar and a little bit of cream in it. And it was just like ice cream. It was incredibly delicious. And the flavor profile of it, and this was in... When was this in February? Was that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, February sixteenth. There's the date. So Tetsu, I think the ver the flavor of it actually improves into deep winter. Mm -hmm. um, and so people were astonished by it, and she really didn't add almost anything to it, and it was like a pudding. Yeah, the chefs really really like it. Savory and sweet, really. I always hear really great things about that. Um, and another thing I want to share with you guys that we did in this project that was cool that people really like quite a bit is we created a flavor wheel. Uh, I'll show you the finished project in a second, the product in a second, but this is, um, uh, you know, this is commonly used you know, in wine tasting, we're very familiar with it and I'll hold coffee and where people talk about the flavor nuances that they're picking up in different wines, right? Well, this was something that a farmer had asked me for that she wanted it for um, tomatoes initially um, to be able to market her tomatoes at the farmer's market and describe the different flavors because, um, you know, I mean, probably this is a master gardener program. You guys probably grow lots of different tomatoes and they're very different from one another. And I worked at the farmer's market for many years and you got this question all the time where people were like, what's the difference? What's the difference in the flavor? What should I do with them? So in order to help farmers to market them as actually different 
things, because a lot of people like to think of winter squash as one thing, right? It's butternut and that's it. But it actually is a lot of different things and they take, can taste quite different from one another. So um, in order to be able to talk about that, we kind of have to go to this next level where we're developing called a lexicon, right? A vocabulary for the different flavors that we have. So we tasted them raw. Uh, this is, Tim set this up for us. And then we tasted, these are all Maximas. And um, it was a variety of different varieties of Maximas. We tasted them raw. And then also these were in the right-hand side of this, the little dots are actually steamed and pureed, different, same squash. Um, and we tasted them. Uh, we did this in silence. Um, we did it in a restaurant that was closed, so there's no smells. You know, you're trying to supposed to get rid of all other types of stimulus. And there was about 30 individuals, all of which were culinary educators or had gone through um, culinary school or were coffee roasters or winemakers or sommeliers. Um, and just together described um, flavor in these different squash. So what we came up after that was this flavor wheel um, and how the flavor wheel works if you're, not, um, if you're not familiar is if you look in the inner part of this wheel, this is uh, more broad categories where you say, I taste this and I taste it, that it's fruity. Well, then the further out you go and sometimes they keep on going further and further out, the more specific you get, but we didn't feel like we needed to get that in depth <laughs> um, is like, what kind of fruity? Are we talking about cucumber fruit? Are we talking about apricot? Um, so this, you know, might seem a little overboard, um, but actually um, farmers have told me that they really appreciate it. Um, and then it helps them to, like I said, to market their, their squash and to be able to um, talk to their customers about how they taste different from one another. Um, so this is something that we came up with in this in the Eat Winter Squash project. They're, they are available to, to purchase if you want them through, there's an Etsy site um, through the Culinary Breeding Network and the Eat Winter Vegetables website that you can buy them for $5 if you want. Um, but they're also online and you can just grab a you know screenshot or download them on the culinarybreedingnetwork.com website as well. And um, I'll take any questions, um, both Alex and I, I, I just went over like the highlights, I feel like of these projects, there was a lot of work that was done to kind of try to get to the bottom of like, you know, evaluating texture and flavor and culinary evaluations of these that Tim did. Um, so again, the resources that you should take a look at, I think, um, is Eat Winter Vegetables and we Eat Winter Squash. Uh, a lot of resources, a lot of um, recipes and videos there. You can go to the uh, Culinary Green Network website as well as Instagram to find out more about um, projects like this one. I think that's Great. it. Thank you both. So if folks, if you do have questions, I see there's a bunch in the Q&A. If you could um, put them in the Q&A, then we can keep track of them. Probably won't be able to answer all the questions live. So we'll um, do some research behind the scenes and get back to you. Um, so let me go through this list and you guys can just tag a team. Um, so this might be a question for Alex. When you were talking about your graphs and you were showing the storage, there was um, a marking that said T slash A. So Kim wants to know what that means on the graph. That's tons per acre. Okay. So with farmers. With a farmer measurement, right. So the more T slash A, the higher yielding is the squash. Thank you. Um, Claire had some audio issues when you were talking about the Georgia candy roaster being a weird squash. Could you describe for her what it means, what you mean by weird? Well, so you can find pictures of, and that's North Georgia candy roaster, because oh, sorry, North Georgia candy roaster, which is, you know, mind blowing that there's so many different kinds of squash. But at any rate, North Georgia candy roaster is a pink, a really big pink banana. If you grow it without irrigation, it's smaller, which is actually an attribute with North Georgia candy roaster, and the yield is cut in half, which in terms of that squash is actually good too because it's so extraordinarily high yielding, puts out so many bananas, it's unbelievable. 
It's delicious squash. I had not been familiar with it, but we grew it in our dryland trials last summer. And the farmers that we work with don't like it because they're big and strange and nobody really wants to buy them. Although I think we've started cultivating a market for them. But, you know, historically, and, and Lane touched on this, is that, you know, historically people grew really big squash to store into the winter and then cut, the, cut them into pieces over time. So with the pink bananas, they actually would cut a piece off and put like wax paper or something over the end. And then, you know, a few days later, cut another piece off and put, had them in a root cellar or something. And that actually can work. It's just that consumers these days don't really know how to do that. And we haven't helped them figure that out. And what people want increasingly are smaller and smaller fruit, which is why we started working with those large squash and then we stopped working with them because the market is for them is really limited. But gardeners obviously can grow those and they're really extraordinary. I did want to mention wheat meat, which you can also find at Eat Winter Squash, which is an Oregon heirloom. And is really long story and has extraordinary flavor. And so I would highly recommend that for gardeners who, who are okay with growing a really big squash because they are really big. Thank you. A um, couple, just a couple quick questions on curing and storage. Mm. So Bruce would like to know how you, what your curing process is. And then... Diane said that she tried storing winter squash in an extra fridge. It was above 35, but they did rot quickly. Is that like humidity, ventilation? Maybe you could talk about how um, the commercial growers do this process and how it might trickle down to us <laughs> who don't have storage rooms. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. So we are, we had farmers who said, you know, who were actually starting to build controlled environment storage facilities, which are really expensive because they were having this rot problem. And so we actually did, and I didn't really talk about that. We actually had a stored, a, a controlled environment storage facility, which was a walk-in with a dehumidifier in it that was maintained at a particular temperature. And also we just stored them in a barn maintained above freezing. And I also like stored things in different weird places like my back porch. What we discovered was that storage environment was not what the problem was ever. It is this disease that we have here and it's the susceptibility of the squash to those diseases that is the key. We did most squash stored better in a barn than in a controlled environment. There were a few exceptions, but it wasn't very significant. So in general, what you really want to do is have store squash above freezing and with good air exchange is what we sort of determined both through more formal trials and also just sort of informal work. Um, and it's really your selection of your squash in terms of how inherently long storing they are and how susceptible they are to these storage rods. In terms of curing, that's a really excellent question. If you read typical extension bulletins on, store, on winter squash, most of them are based on work that was done decades ago in like the Northeast of the United States where we have a real winter and you have to go through sort of extraordinary efforts to keep things above freezing, which isn't actually true here in the Willamette Valley because we have such mild, humid winters. Um, but so what we showed is that the humidity in the winter is not a problem. You don't need to dehumidify. And if you do, they actually, it can desiccate, you know, you the squash, you lose moisture faster and you can actually get wrinkling and desiccation of the squash. So keeping them humid doesn't seem to be a problem as long as there's good air exchange. So back to curing, there isn't good data on curing. What we, what I sort of came up with is that 
you want to get your squash out of the field when they're physiologically mature and, and as soon as possible because bad things can happen to squash in the field. Rodents can eat them. They can get sunburned. They can crack because they've already sort of set their skin and then you get a rain and then they crack. And, uh, and they also get really dirty and potentially there are storage rot pathogens on the, in the soil. So what I've been doing with farmers is to help them better understand when the squash are ready to come out of the field and off of their mother plants. And that's typically 45 days after pollination as a general rule. So amazingly, you can bring squash out of the field and into storage much earlier than people think. And there, while a lot of farmers think that it's good to leave them out in the field to cure, there's no scientific evidence that backs up that, that idea. So in our, what we talk about is like, when are they physiologically mature, which is across all squash, as a general rule, 45 days after pollination. Many squash pollinate their fruit or set fruit over many weeks. Some of them set them in a more concerted set. So you have to kind of be paying attention. But we used to harvest our squash very early in September and then bring them in to ripen. So we don't talk about curing, but we talk about ripening. And actually, I can send you some articles written by Brent Loy, who's a squash breeder from the University of New Hampshire, who's written some really great farmer-friendly, gardener-friendly um, articles about all of these things. So talking about winter squash physiology and ripening and how the different species are different and why that matters, which is sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but is really useful information. And so some squash are ripe when you harvest them, like the pepos, like delicatas, for example, or acorns, whereas most of the maximas need to be ripened. And for example, sweet meat and probably even tetsu shouldn't really even be eaten before, in some of the kabochas before, you know, late October, if not Thanksgiving. Thanks. I think that would be really helpful for folks because there's a lot of those types of questions. About yeah, it's really fascinating. I give those to farmers all the time and they are, it completely changes their approach to winter squash. And I have been trying to get farmers to harvest much earlier and it really helps with their, their storage and their profitability in squash. It really, really helps. Right. So I think you have converted probably at least half of our audience to trying the tetsu. <laughs> and their tetsu is awesome. But they're clamoring. They want to know a couple things. Where are some good places to purchase the seeds? And, yeah, because it's not too late to plant. And that was the second question. Nice lead in. Is it too late now yep. if folks are in maybe the Willamette Valley area or, you know, general Pacific Northwest? Is it too late? To get started on not at all i i have direct seeded tetsu in late may may i mean tetsu and other any other squash you can still direct seed them now or start them and transplant them tetsu kabuto is now offered by johnny's selected seeds it, it was really hard to find before but johnny's has started carrying it as a result of the project and also nickels here in albany oregon they they have always sold Tetsu Kabuto, astonishingly. And the, some of the people who work there were some of the people who encouraged me to work on it because they love it so much. Um, so Nichols Seed is a place to get seed for Tetsu also. Yeah, I was lucky enough to go to Lane's event and eat your delicious waffle cone. Oh, really? Wasn't that great? It was amazing, I have to admit. <laughs> it was really, really good. Um, so uh, there's a question, uh, will these variety showcases be happening again? What are some of your plans, Lane, for your, um, you know, as you have other winter vegetable projects? Are there plans to keep holding these? I know we're in the age of COVID-19, maybe not right now, but what's, what's some of your plans, Lane? I mean, beyond COVID, if there wasn't COVID, yes. We have, we have the Sagra and we have the variety showcase as part of our winter vegetables 
um, pro project this year. Um, those were to happen in December. I mean, I guess we need to wait and see what's going to happen and how many, because we had a thousand people at the Sagra, 700 people at the Variety Showcase. It's a lot of people to have all together. Even if we don't have those this year, or we have to take, you know, a year or two off, we will, um, we will be doing something else in lieu of that. We've already, we just had a meeting, um, last week to talk about some options for that. So we do have plans in the works. We're not going to stop promoting winter vegetables and winter squash and trying to get people to, to eat those. Um, still very excited about all of it. It just might look different for when we can't gather, but yeah, it will continue. Great. Um, so Kate is uh, at Johnny Seeds website and looking for these seeds. And um, it looks like it says on the website that it must be grown near butternut a kabocha hubbard or buttercup to produce fruit is this correct and um, is this something that folks need to be thinking about yes yeah, so that's true so tetsu is an interspecies cross so it is it is sterile like a donkey so it needs pollen from another so it's a cross of a machado which is the butternut family and a Maxima, which is like the Kabocha family. So you have to have a, a variety of one of those two species somewhere nearby in order to get the pollen to fertilize the fruit. You can't just grow only tetsu. So Kate, look at Alex's list that we're gonna send and pick another one and put it in your shopping cart. <laughs> right. Do it quick before all the 200 other people <laughs> buy out all the seeds. Right, so popular. <laughs> um, so folks, we are at 11 and I know that there are a ton of questions. So what, um, so what I'm gonna do is follow up on uh, offline and see if I can find this information if it's something that's specific that Alex or Lane need to answer I'll follow up with them um, there was a request to get sort of a summary of all these questions so I'll do my best to get that out when I send out the recording um, but I did want to thank you both Lane and Alex for spending an hour with us this morning we really all appreciate it you can't hear everyone clapping but we're yeah. all um, clapping and we really appreciate all of your research efforts so thank you all thank you for having us it was fun all right bye-bye everybody bye